This is tuna on toast. Very exciting day, tuna on toast. We're about to have Amy, Kevin, Justin, and Jesse, the interrupters. They're here. Oh my God, they're here. One knock? Oh, that, that must be the joke. Who is it? Hello? Good to see you, oh, too. Good to see you. There they are. Oh, my God. I hope you left room happening? for dessert. Hi. Yes. There's room. No. <laughs> no way. <laughs> oh, my God. They're edible, and too. Yes. Thank you. Thank we can you eat your guys. face. You can eat my face. <laughs> I almost wore that same says, shirt tonight. It says the interrupters love striker. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. <laughs> Do you guys want anything to drink? Well, here. Let's look at We got to look at the fridge. Are in your fridge? We can, but because if you're it's thirsty... Oh, liquid death. Would you like it water? We love liquid okay. death. Yes. Best water around. I literally had a spin drift and a liquid death today. Which one do you want? You can have all the liquid death. Okay. I'm gonna murder that first. All right. <laughs> no. Liquid death. You know. <laughs> so follow me this way. Okay. okay. Everyone, please sit on the couch except for Kevin. Okay. Okay. Kevin has to come with me for a second. You guys just hang here. Okay. <sighs> We're gonna play a game. During the episode. Okay. Yes. Know your Bologna. Okay. You're the one that I'm asking questions to. They're going to answer see how well they know you. Oh, okay. I love Do you have two brothers or does Amy know you the best? Oh, I love so these. So these are the questions. All right. If you had one last meal on earth, give me three things that you for sure would want and be specific. Like, is it Tony Roma's onion rings? Like, that sort of thing. Ooh, okay. If I had one last meal on earth, it would probably be... So is Kevin going to do this interview all by himself? <laughs> <laughs> He's just in there doing impressions of us. <laughs> Here we go. Chase. All right. Okay. Sorry, guys. It's fine. Do you guys want to see my first tattoo? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any tattoos? I don't have any tattoos. Really? Neither do I. Just scars. It's just scars. Broken down. Mental scars. Yeah. <laughs> what are you guys doing in there? You'll see during the hangout session. <laughs> wow. Okay. Here we go. Okay. The door doesn't go farther than this. Watch your head. Watch your feet. First? Well, yeah, because you're going to write here, right? There you go. Then and I'm here. Right there. There. And your mic comes from over here. Okay, all right. This is nice. Like the drum throne. And then this twins. is really nice. You're just passing that one. Is that, are you guys okay passing it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Test one, two, three. Hello, hello, hello. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tuna on Toast. I am Ted Stryker, joined by an awesome band whose new album, In the Wild, comes out on August 5th, which is three days from now. They're here at my house in the studio. The Interrupters! Hey! Hey guys. Yes. We've known each other a long time, and I've gone hiking with the twins. We've done some things together, been to a lot of shows, but now... Here at the house, has our relationship, Kevin, like gone up four notches? I feel like this is the, yeah, this is when it starts to get serious, you know? <laughs> All right. You're like, you're, you you kind of sounded like the cable guy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like once I see what's inside of your medicine cabinet, I'll be a little bit more, I'll know more. We've already seen what's inside the fridge. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yes. And now as you guys were driving here, were you thinking, Amy, like, why are we going to this idiot's house right now we could just go to a normal studio we have to go to his house absolutely not no okay. we love you and this is yeah. awesome yeah this is great and this is a rad studio and honestly as we're probably going to touch upon later on some of the best studios are in houses are oh they not right because <laughs> maybe some people in this room the four of you recorded the new album at home yes <laughs> yes exactly yeah. but we love your show and we're so yeah. excited to be Honored here thank to be you here. yeah thank you guys i'm very excited to have you we i've had three band members many times on Tuna on Toast, but we are squeezed in like crazy here. So like hopefully- Like sardines? Like sardines, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. Okay, so in just a couple days from now, the new album comes out. Amy, I'll go to you. Are the nerves different from previous years or is it same old, Maybe anxiety, no anxiety. Like what? What is it like? I'm always just like cruising at the <laughs> at the anxiety altitude, um, but I'm like really excited. I'm. I feel that this is the most personal album ever. It's the story of my life. I'm finally, you know, opening up more than I, I ever have before. I'm finally 
just being, I've just reached another level of vulnerability in my writing. And so I'm excited to, to share it. Really excited. Is that tough to do in front of your bandmates or is it more tough to do it in front of people you don't know to be that vulnerable? Well, the, the, these guys have seen every part of me. So being vulnerable yeah. in front of them is not, doesn't even feel vulnerable. It just feels normal. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I just feel that in writing this record and unveiling, you know, getting just deeper within myself, I was able to go deeper in the lyrics. And, um, and I think that it's just, I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of the, the work that, I, that we put in. The collection of songs is called In the Wild. Uh, where and when in the process does Amy say to you, hey, for these songs, I really, really want to go this direction, my life, my history, autobiographical? Like, how does that, how did that work? I mean, I feel like every record we make, we take a massive inventory of everything we've ever written. And that could be old demos, voice memos, an idea that just gets stuck in our head that we're always singing while we're on tour. And before we go in the studio, we just kind of, get our collection of ideas together and just go through all of them. Then from there, we kind of get together and decide like, which ones could we try to play? And as we do that, we whittle it down even further. And this time we got it down to like, I think we were at like 40 song ideas. Whoa! And once we got in the studio, the ones that she felt the most connected to, that's always what we go with. And the ones this time that she felt the most connected to were the personal autobiographical ones. And it just was like a no brainer of like, okay, well then let's leave these other songs off and go with these ones because it felt like the the thing you definitely want in a band is for the singer to be all about every single sure. song that right. we're putting on this record. You know what I mean? So it's like, if that's the direction we're going, we're all in every time. And with the lyrics that you wrote, did you hear any music beforehand or you brought, you brought in all these ideas and then the collection of the band says, okay, let's try this. I'm going to drum here. I'm going to bass. I'm going to guitar. Like how, how did that work? Yeah. I mean, each song is a little different, but for the most part, we have the, the seed of the song. Sometimes we have a verse and a chorus, or sometimes I just have a chorus and we then all get together and kind of see what we all kind of add to it to sort of make it our own or, yeah. or make it a, finished there's always like the idea or the concept of the song and like some melody of it sometimes there's a chord progression too but sometimes there's not and then we have to go in and kind of figure it out and then it's the fun part of kind of figuring out what feels the best and we always do that like the four of us in a room playing live because that's when you know right away like if we could if it feels good with just the four of us doing this like this is the way we should go. And if this feels weird, we should try a different style, different tempo. Yeah, different, we try that a lot. Different yeah. styles, tempos, different, like, let's just see, do it this style. Let's try this style. Let's try this style. And whatever, whatever serves the spirit of the song, the message of the song and yeah. the feeling, whatever is kind of, for me, what pulls at the heartstrings the most is the one that I'm, I want to do, you know? Justin, was it tough getting in the room with everybody in the middle of COVID and not being lazy or was there a hunger like you never had before? Where did it fall for you personally? No, it was definitely hunger. We had enough lazy time before all that to get it out of the way. <laughs> so like once we started actually working on the record, like, all right, we're going in tomorrow, two o'clock. It's like, great. I can't wait. And then we'd get in there and you would just lose track of time. You'd be like, oh, it's eight already. We didn't get dinner. And uh, it was, yeah, it was really, really fun. And this is medium personal, but Jesse, what was the living situation during COVID, were you guys together in a place? Were you with out there? Like what? What was going on? Yeah, so we all lived together. So me and Justin, were, oh, me and Justin were home uh, with my now wife. We were just engaged at the time, but now we're married, and they were at their house. So the five of us were kind of all secluded on our property, um, bubbled up, bubbled up, bubbled up. Yeah, and just down for whatever yeah <laughs> we live together we work together we eat together yeah i know they eat together all the time oh yeah they eat together all the time yeah but when we were doing the record it was really nice because there was uh, they're they're the chefs of the family uh -huh. and they would cook a lot for us and feed us which yeah. was really nice it was nice getting that text like hey do you want a breakfast sandwich and i'm like yes <laughs> i think right before the lockdown or maybe during you guys the twins got this flat top grill <laughs> outside <laughs> It's like right on their <laughs> patio. It's like a diner. Like sometimes yeah. they're just flipping pancakes out there. Making I looked at photos of it every day for like three months. And then finally was like, 
my, my, my wife's parents were coming to town to visit for a month and I was like, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> and I got it. And it's my favorite thing I've ever bought yeah. myself. <laughs> it's my favorite thing you've ever bought. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Do you cook for your wife's parents? Oh yeah. Yeah. What the yeah. hell? Not Why would that, you do something like when that? When I got that, her father was coming to town and he's what? like, Hey, I'm going to buy you a smoker because I want to smoke some meat when you, when we're in town. And I was like, I just bought it out to a flat top girl. I'm going to have like a little mini kitchen outdoors. <laughs> yeah. But it, yeah. Yeah, we cook big meals all the time. It's That's either- so impressive. Because when I think, oh my God, there's parents of a partner coming over, I just think nervous butterflies and stomach ache, and you got to be have bring your A game, yeah. and now you got to cook your A game. Flame laws are awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're super sweet. Kevin, with all your history in this music world mm-hmm. and the success of the Interrupters, do you have anything going on in the back of your head that you have to live up to something in your own mind right now, or? that doesn't even happen with you. I'm constantly just in awe and super grateful of the people I get to make music with. And I just have to keep up with them. That And that was kind of with making this record and being the producer of the record right. was like, and when, I, when they're performing the way they're performing, my job's easy. And the other thing is we all trust each other so much that like, you know, there's different production you know, techniques. And I think there's some people that are really hands-on with like, it's gotta be exactly like this, exactly like this. But like, I'm always like throwing it back to them. And especially too, like with you, like with Jesse on drums, like, oh, I was thinking something like this, try that. And then he'll try it. And then he'll be like, well, what about if we did it more? And I'm like, yes, now we're speaking the same language. It's never like you have to do it like this and it has to be like that. And then Amy would hear stuff. And if she's got an idea, you know, as like the songwriter, like I want the production to reflect the feeling she has with that. So the only thing I wanted to live up to was I was so, so happy with these songs and grateful to be making this record that like, I just wanted them to be as good as they can be with the recordings we had. And like what in that time, it's like every record is like a moment in time. You know what I mean? Right. If we tried right. to re-record our first record or our second record next week, it would be different. There might be parts of it that is like better, but then it would, you, there'd be parts that you lose because it's like almost like a diary entry. So like, with this record, we did have the luxury of time and we just wanted each song to just be as good as it could be and have the whole thing just be cohesive. And So that's all I really needed to live up to, you know? And when you're stacking one song against the next, you're like, oh, well, this one is so great. How can we make this one as good as this one? And then you have like kind of a barometer to, to kind of judge on. Amy, you guys have worked with obviously Tim Armstrong on your records. He's producer and now... It's this gentleman doing it. Was there a conversation that, all right, when we make the new album, he's going to produce this one. How did that, how did the band come together to say, yeah, of course we're going to do it this way? Um, Well, it was, it was the pandemic, you know, so we're just locked down, you know, (laughs) so we called Tim and we couldn't go to the studio and we had done some co-writing with him before the, the, the pandemic, before the lockdown. And so, you know, he gave us this blessing and, and, um, he was happy to hear that we were, had a studio that we could record in. And and some of those songs that we had like co-written with him before ended up fitting into the big picture of the story that we, that became in the wild. So that's cool. He's represented as like a songwriter, a co-writer on, on a couple of these tracks. So it's kind of like, we still have like in our DNA, you know, the Hellcat records and all of that stuff. And he's singing on a track. Singing on a track. I mean, everything on this record kind of happened, just it was a result of the situation we were in. Like if a year before I was like, hey, you guys, we're going to not leave the house for a year (laughs) and build a studio in the garage. They'd be like, you're crazy. Like, can I at least go to the beach or the movies? I'd be like, no, we're not going anywhere. (laughs) Like, can you imagine that conversation? And we're just going to sit in a 10 by 10 10. room and do this album. But that's what we did. They built it. They took the rehearsal space and they built a studio from YouTube videos. Come on. Yeah, it's just a little bit longer than this room. It's not much bigger than this room. And you yeah. went on YouTube, and what did you search for your first search? <laughs> uh, that's a good question, because we had built, like, shelves and stuff, so we knew our way around, like, a saw. <laughs> but building <laughs> tables and furniture. Yes. Yeah. And, like, a rack space to put uh, actual gear in. Yeah, yeah like, they I, built all the studio furniture. Yeah, like, that whoa. was actually more complicated at the end because, like, we built it, and we're like, oh, it's perfect. You know, it was supposed to be, like, 23 inches or something. No, Great. it was, like, 19 and 3 inches. <laughs> yeah, but what they don't tell you is that once you put something together, the wood shrinks. Uh-oh. So, like, <laughs> overnight it kind of shrunk, and then we are like, per- first piece of gear, and it was just, like, this is a little bit too, too small. <laughs> 
So they were like trying to get it in. Like, it, works. <laughs> it works great. Yeah. <laughs> I think we flipped it on its back and tried to let like, gravity do some of the work. Like, yeah. Pushing this compressor. It was pretty. In, like, it was pretty <laughs> funny though because every day, okay, like when I when we kind of conceptualize this idea of like, okay, we're going to build this studio. And I go to the twins and I'm like, you guys just, they just had been acquiring power tools over the course. And I don't know what they were planning on doing yeah, with these power seriously. tools, yeah. but they had been acquiring a collection <laughs> of power tools. And I was like, you've got the tools. We have all this scrap wood because we, I started looking into like to get all this stuff for a studio and it was just like way too expensive. And I was like, well, this rack that costs $1,700, you guys could build for like 200 bucks. And you know, and we were like, absolutely. Yeah. So I was like, in my mind, I'm like, in two weeks, we're good. Six weeks later, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, the majority of it had been built. But then I start getting crazy with like, I remember walking in the room one day and saying, the walls, now, th these tables are too nice. Now we need to fabricate the walls. So I went on joannesfabrics.com and like <laughs> bought all this. Oh my like, God. Like it looked like Dickie's like khaki fabric. And I we got staple guns and started stapling it. And I think totally the, DIY. Oh yeah. Right. 100%. And the it the dryer, the hole in the wall. Yeah, we, they had so, a YouTube that to answer your question. Oh, that was a yeah. big YouTube thing. We needed to put a hole in the wall to run cables. Okay. And it was <laughs> the the walls are extra thick because like one side is kind of like uh, treated with like a soundproof wood and the plaster. So to get through it, we had to buy one of those dryer hole drillers. Right. Like to install a dryer <laughs> vent. Right. Yeah. It was like yeah. skinny yeah. saws yeah. or or it looks like this and it goes grrr, and it goes okay. really fast. Yeah. And I just remember us watching that video and being like, and and yeah, I mean, we like, rent. If we so, mess up, there's, a, mess there's, up, there's like, a big hole in the wall if we yeah, mess yeah. up. So, but you guys did a great job and they put PVC pipe through it. So the cables are like laying in this. I mean, and they built boxes around our amps so that, that we won't wake the neighbors. You know, like yeah. little isolation oh boxes, God. which is really what great. That's so inspirational for like <laughs> any young bands that are watching right now. These guys have years and years of experience. And here you are at home during the pandemic, YouTubing <laughs> and building this out. That's so, so impressive. I didn't build Thank anything. <laughs> oh, but you YouTube, I'm sure. Yeah, you I, I, I was like, this is really great. You guys yeah. make you a tea or something. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I was writing lyrics and, and it's true and being introspective and I was doing other things, mm -hmm. but while they were in the backyard doing the, the sanding and the drilling and things. So from some of the S you have gone through in your life and also the good stuff in your life, as a result of all that, all that, that led you to a lot of the songs that are on this album. Yes. Wow. So when you, a second ago, introspective, you said, so did you have to like put the pen up here and think about like some of these times and then just like tears stream down your face or am I overthinking this? No, no. Um, this is a, th that happens. <laughs> that happens a lot. But th I think the biggest thing that, that changed my life in the course of making this record is this treatment that I did called TMS. And I did it around the time you guys were building. It was, yeah. Simon during the time, yeah. during the time. So they were building the studio and I was every day for six weeks, I went to treatment for depression. And the, um, it basically, have you heard of it? Like, do you, are you familiar with no, it at all? No. Transcranial magnetic stimulation okay. therapy. Yeah. And so basically, um, they, you know, doctors studied, scientists studied a hundred thousand brains and they saw that in, all of these brains, there was a little dark spot in the brain with people with major depression that didn't light up, that it was just like this little black spot that just didn't get any stimulation to okay. it. And for whatever reason, they kind of found, this is kind of interesting. Why is it that all these people with depression have this one part of the brain that's not simulated? So I've had major depressive disorder. I've had major depression most of my life, all of my life, really, since I can remember. I just thought that was life, to be honest. I just thought... I just, I, I didn't know that, that I, I did never knew the feeling of waking up in the morning and being happy that you woke up until I did this treatment. Mm -hmm. So basically they put a magnet on your head and they stimulate that part of your brain for six weeks. Every day you get one day off a week, but it's an hour a day for six weeks. And when I started going, I, when I went to the, when I went to the um, doctor, they do all of this analysis and you tell them between one and 10, how you're feeling, 10 being you are actively wanting to die and one being like, you're so excited about life, super happy and there's no complaints and everything's perfect. And I, when I started going, once I answered the questions, I was like, well, I guess, I mean, I'm a 10. 
I'm a 10. Oh. And I've been a 10 for a long time. Oh. Maybe a 9 on a good day or something. But I'm like, between a 9 or a 10, that's just been my life. I didn't... And I've been on many antidepressants and they would work for a little bit. But for the most part, my... I just had been, I have struggled with depression. I just didn't think there was a help for me. At the end of the six weeks, so after, after a couple of weeks, I got down to a nine and an eight and I went to my doctor and I, I just said, if I leave here an eight, which is, which is not wanting to die, but not being super excited about, about um, waking up in the morning, but you know, not being uh, in that dark of a place that I had been in, I'm so happy with an eight and eight's great. Eight is the best I could imagine. I, right. And I said, I don't think I could ever be anything. I just didn't have a lot of hope that I could be any uh, better than that. It was kind of happy that I was going to get that. Which, and, and the, hold on, but I mean, for most people, I would say, I want to be a four. And you're saying that you'd be happy with an eight, which makes me sad to hear you say that. Sorry to interrupt, but keep going. Well, it was, that was, that was the best. I mean, I, in looking at the number system and what that meant, I was just like, if I could live my life as an eight, I didn't think it could, I, I really thought that would be something I, I, I could carry. And that's something I could manage. And he said to me, he's like, I've seen your file. I've, we've, in, we've analyzed you, everything that I know about you. He's like, I think we could get you down to a one or a two. And I was like, yeah, you don't know my life. Like, there's no way. I, I've the life I've lived, the things that have happened to me. There's, it just there's, I doubt it. You know, so I was very skeptical, but I kept going. And then I was a six, seven, and a six, and a five. And by the end of my six weeks, I, I mean, it choked up. At the end, I was, I really was a two. And I, I've been a two since then as my baseline. Of course you have days like two, three, four, whatever, sure. you know, but my baseline is like a solid two. I don't know what one, one freaks me out. Like, I don't know one, I, I don't know. That's just, I don't know what that is. That's robotic. Yeah. I think one's like, one something. just seems scary to me, yeah. but it's like a solid two. And I feel for the first time, literally in my entire life, every day I wake up and Good. I'm so grateful that I woke up. I'm so happy to be alive. I feel so, I feel like this total rebirth. This, and because of that rebirth and being so excited about living and it does feel like I'm truly living for the first time instead of just surviving. I feel like all of my life I've just been surviving from one traumatic event to the next and just surviving, surviving and just being it's kind of thinking that my existence was this cosmic punishment that I, I just have to kind of do my time. And w once I got the help that I needed, I'm now actually like living and happy and happy to be alive and like even food tastes better. Music sounds sweeter. Like everything is, is just like the first time I'm living almost. So to answer your question, this record is a lot of the lyrics were written because I had enough strength to go to those darker places that I couldn't really look at before. Because when you're already like a nine or a 10, you really don't want to, dig too deep because that right. could be kind of scary. Right. So I was able to have the strength and the mental health, like I was mentally healthy enough to really look at things I was always too afraid to look at. And that's that's what I wrote. Thank you for sharing all of that. Wow. <laughs> deep breath. <laughs> that was amazing. So here's what we're gonna do now. Like we're gonna switch gears a little bit because that was it, let's change it. I'm, we just learned so much about Amy. Now we're gonna play no, you're sorry. Did I bum everybody out? Not at oh, all. No, it's great. It that was happy amazing. Ending. It no. is happy. Okay. Ending. That was perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was perfect. So okay. Real. And it circles back to what you were talking about earlier when you're like, how do you know which songs are the songs? It's like when she did all that work and was feeling so strongly about this collection of songs, it's like all we could do is mess it up at that point. So we're like, we just want to do our best to like support these songs and let them tell my story and, and tell her story and be as strong as they could each be. So, yeah. And this is how we segue. We just learned so much about you and we've learned so much over the years, but now we're going to see how much you guys know about that guy. Oh wow. my God. Before we get on here, I asked Kevin some questions oh my God. and we're going to see if you can match his answer. And every time you get it right, you'll get a point. Okay. So here we go. It's no, you're Bavona. <laughs> but this Bavona. No, you're Bavona. That's amazing. First it's question. Dangerous. And Amy, you answer first, and then you guys go. Okay. I asked Kevin, Kevin, 
What's your favorite movie of all time? What did he say? His favorite movie. Uh, either. Uh, I, I, uh, One, don't give them clue. One answer, please. Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. He said, I'm a, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Give everybody a point. Oh, sorry, Sean. <laughs> and then you're going to say, Home Alone. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, but you know, yeah, cumulative yeah, has yeah. to be for a scam. I asked Kevin, Kevin, what is slash who is your number one musical guilty pleasure of all time? Amy, who did he say? Um, uh, I see. Uh, oh wait, uh, the hot stepper. <laughs> I need Kamosi. Yeah, guilty. I love I need Kamosi. I have no guilt about okay. that. Okay, wait. A, a oh, guilt. Sorry, a guilty that. pleasure. Like, who do you listen to? Just an artist that he likes. <laughs> it could be a good artist, but we need an answer, could please. Be an iconic artist. Yeah. An iconic artist. That is a, I mean, I just. I I don't know because any if I I don't know. You have to take, there's a million artists out there. A guilty pleasure? Yes. I think it's a fine line. You don't want to insult Jesse, go ahead, Jesse. That's what I'm saying. I mean this with all due respect. That's what I don't, I don't disrespect any artist. I'm going to go with his his karaoke guy, Michael McDonald. Michael McDonald. Michael McDonald, okay. That's a good one. It's not guilty because they're amazing, but Huey Lewis. Go with Huey Lewis. Amy? Uh, Yeah, I'm going to say Michael McDonald. (laughs) His number one guilty pleasure is? (laughs) Oh, Michael McDonald! (laughs) Michael McDonald. Hey, shout out to Michael McDonald. Oh my God. I mean, Justin's losing right now. Amazing oh my gosh. Uh, here we go. Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to be disrespectful to any artist. Hey, listen. There's no disrespect here. <laughs> no. When I first belief. met Kevin, yeah, the only piece of art that he had in his bedroom was a picture of Michael McDonald. <laughs> oh my it was like a record. It was like set up kind of like this. And, and he, I was and like, you need art you. on the walls. What is this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Jesse, we're gonna start with you on this. I asked Kevin. And he gave me three answers. If he had one last meal on earth, so it's his last supper, like he was on death row. All right, you get three food items. Just name one, and we'll see if it's one of the three. Just one? Yep. Something from Taco Bell. Something from Taco Bell. What do you think? Ouch. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I don't know. So the three items that you could get, I know that chocolate chip cookies would be one of them. Okay, so that is, are you going to lock in chocolate chip cookies? If, 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 if absolutely, he, okay. th- if he had one dessert, or one thing, it would be chocolate chip cookies. Cool Ranch Doritos. <laughs> Justin, Justin, okay, you're saying Cool I Ranch was Doritos? If at home listening to this or watching this, I'd be like, what in the 7-Eleven parking lot <laughs> is going on in Kevin's stomach? He gave me three answers. Pasta's probably one of them, but I already said Taco Bell. No, you want to change your answer? You can change it. Sure, pasta. Twins the twins pasta. pasta. What Easy are the other tacos. two? Oh, in and my out. tacos. I do make a good taco. You do. I do. It That's says so twins sweet. pasta. Amy's tacos yeah. in and out and the twins pasta. Yeah. Oh, that would be that would be my three death row meals, right? There. That's really great. I know cookies aren't really a meal, but you, you do, do love chocolate chip cookies. cookies. <laughs> so we all lost that one. I'm not gonna take a point on that. I know, okay, by Justin, the way, you're we're first gonna on this talk one. about this on the way home. <laughs> cool ranch Doritos. I mean, when we were talking about guilty pleasures, like this wasn't Last one, I asked Kevin, Kevin, who is your number one all-time celebrity crush? Who did he say? Celebrity crush. Um, He doesn't really have one. Macaulay Culkin. (laughs) Macaulay Culkin. He's locking in Macaulay Culkin. Good guess. Um, Nev Campbell. (laughs) Going with Nev Campbell. Amy. Oh my gosh, you think I would know this? I should have asked. You. I, I mean, I feel like I've asked you before. Mm. I mean, Jesse's kind of drawing back okay. to 1996 well, Kevin celebrity listen, crush. I but. don't know. Who, I don't know who it is, but whoever it is, she's been in many rom coms. Kevin is a sucker for rom coms. So oh, that's true. Whoever whoever she guy. is, she's probably in rom coms. Would be my well, guess. His answer is. Oh. 
Oh. He didn't even hesitate. One half a millisecond. He's like, Amy, Amy. Yeah. That, well, look, I, that was my first guess, but I didn't want to. <laughs> You're like, I couldn't good see. job, guys. You did pretty good, right? Yeah, you guys did good. F- food stuff was a little weird. I, mean, <laughs> I, I just because I had Taco Bell like midnight last night. <laughs> uh, I want a, qu- a question for you. Before the Interrupters officially became a band, yeah. and you were working with musicians out there that everybody knows. One thing that I have never learned from you is how did you, who did you prove yourself to that they said, come on back young man and let's work and I want to teach you stuff. It's weird, right? Well, we <laughs> no, were, we're, we're extremely smart. Well, we were lucky enough also to go to a high school that was like a music high school called Hamilton in LA and they had an electronic music class that I was very advanced in. And that's like what I spent, you know, all those years learning about recording and stuff. So and I played in bands. There were so many musicians there. And my band that like this, there was this band in my high school that I was a big fan of. They were like seniors when I was freshman kind of deal. You know what I mean? And then one day they called me to record them and help set up their studio in their garage. When to I was, be like the engineer. Yeah, producer when I was in like things? 10th grade. Okay. And I went in and then I ended up joining that band. And the, one of the guitar players left to go work for, he was out of high school and he went to work for a management company. Now, in working at that management company, he met a manager that managed a band called The Transplants who told him we were the Transplants are looking for a keyboard player to go on the Warp Tour. And he goes, oh, I know someone that would be perfect for that. And then they called me and I auditioned and I got the gig. And that was kind how of, old were you? 18. 18. Now, were you, did you grow up striving to be a keyboard player? No, but in the studio with like the people that I grew up recording, like they all knew that I knew my way around keyboards and like I could get from point A to point B. And Kevin another, can play every instrument. Well, another <laughs> thing about our high school, thank you, is that we had to take piano class. So I learned Beatles songs and I, and I knew my way around a keyboard enough. And I went to my transplants audition, 18 years old, you know, 105 pounds. Uh, my eight, dad dropped me off. With an 80 like, pound keyboard. Yeah, with a gigantic keyboard. You brought and, your keyboard. Now, who was at the audition? So when I walked in, it was, it was Tim Armstrong. Okay. And I think... When I first got there, it was just him. And I was a massive Rancid fan. And also, I had seen the Transplants on their very first tour a couple years prior to that. Like Diamonds and Guns. Yes. Okay. Like, they did two nights at the Roxy. I went I went up to Fresno to see him. Like, I was into it, you know? So that, <laughs> that's why my friend recommended me. He knew that I, like, knew the tunes. So I go in there with my gigantic keyboard. And um, I walked in in the middle of someone else's audition, too. There was another guy there. <laughs> and I kind of sized him up real quick. And I like went outside. And I was just kind of like, oh. oh I was God. so nervous, too. And then Tim comes outside. And he's like, hey, so you play keyboard? I'm like, yeah, I play keyboard. And he goes, well, cool. Yeah, this guy's pretty good. But um, we have a lot of samples on our new record. There's a lot of cool sounds. And I'm just trying to figure out how to get those sounds, like, to come out of the speakers, you know? And I was like, well, I actually have Pro Tools at home, and if you give me your album, like, Master Stems, I could take them home, put the samples on my keyboard, and then they'll be exactly as they are on your album. And he goes, really? You got Pro Tools at home? Because my dad's an engineer, and he had, like, a little Pro Tools rig in the house. And I was like, yes. Which is kind of crazy to think about now that I'm like, give me your masters. Right. <laughs> like, oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to so meet then, you. So then he, go, he, he goes back in the room. The other guy leaves. He asked me to come in oh, and he's like, could you play Diamonds and Guns? So I played it on piano. He goes, okay, yeah, yeah, that's good. And and I was like, I, I think I'm in. You know what I mean? Wait, and hold on. He said, play Diamonds and Guns. And yeah. I know that end. Doo, 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 yep. doo. And how many seconds or minutes did you play it? I played like two bars of it. And he could tell by the two bars because it's like a loop. He was like, okay, yeah, you got it. Um, And I, I just remember being so nervous. I was like kind of like out of my body. And then like, you know, Skinhead Rob shows up. Yeah. Uh, Travis Barker shows up. And everyone shows up for band practice. But like, I hadn't in my mind finished the audition yet. So I'm standing there and everyone's just like, why is there a child in our practice room behind this giant keyboard? But anyways, long story short, I got the gig. I went on the warp tour with them. Come on! I know, and through that, you know, Whoa. I did a lot of engineering work with Tim and Travis had a studio too right. at the time. So when we got home from tour, I would go kind of work on other projects with those guys. And then I roadied for a bunch of bands. I just tried to stay busy in music because at the time, I, I was like, I'm going to take a year off before I go to college. I like told my dad and, and he, he was like, really wanted me to go to college. And I was like, I'm going to get work in music within the first year. And after the first semester, he was like, Mm-mm. and then I get the warp tour and I was just like, all right, I got to stay busy. So then I would do anything. If I was getting coffee, if I was engineering, if I was setting up drums, guitars, whatever. And through that, I made so many friends and we in the, that world of like touring roadies and stuff, everyone looks out for each other. And if you get along, cause like, 50% of your job qualification is being 
cool on a tour bus to be around <laughs> and not annoying. Sure. So I worked really hard on being not annoying. You know, <laughs> I'm sure they would but be were like, you just you wide know? eyed and hyper or low key and absorbing like, and everything happening. Terrified. Just te I just remember <laughs> like. There would be days where I'm like, did I say one word to anybody all day today? I did on the warp tour. I'd just be walking around like, oh my gosh, like there's the offspring, there's the dropkick Murphys, you know, there's all these bands, and I'm just like, ah, so scared. <laughs> Don't say the wrong thing. Don't say the wrong thing. But yeah, I mean, I but but you know, it's funny is like now all of these guys are such a huge part of all of our story, you know, with Tim producing our records and putting out our records and like us recording our our record our second record at Travis's studio and, and us opening up for Blink, us opening up for Rancid, opening up for the Transplants. Like th it's, it's kind of like all melded into this one kind of like larger family thing that I'm so happy to be a part of. It's, it's awesome. When, when we did uh, a tour with the Transplants and Rancid, Kevin played in the Interrupters and then he went on stage with uh, and played bass in the, in the Transplants. Transplants. And then went on stage and played keys Keyboard. with Rancid. Yeah. So he was doing three sets a night. Three sets a oh night. My yeah. God. Yeah. But I mean, for the kid who used to go to the Warp Tour to see Rancid, who waited outside this abandoned cattle ranch in Fresno to see the transplants, I was like, this is such an amazing opportunity. Yeah. And my band's on the bill, too. Like, <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. The months leading up to the formation of the four of you starting the band, was it someone outside of the four of you that said, you guys should be a band? What the hell is going on? You're playing in all these other bands. You should be a unit. What happened? What it was, was Kevin was producing Amy's next solo record at the time. Right. And it took them to finish the record. It was at mix. And Amy goes, I don't want to be a solo artist anymore. <laughs> She's like, I want to yeah. be in a band. And we had played on those sessions for the solo. You album. did. Oh yeah. yeah they were on it. it. Yeah. Justin played some bass and keys, I think. Yeah. 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 So that rec, there's a unreleased solo, album, but now it's a treasure trove of songs for us. Yeah. That's also Tim was co-writing on that record right. too. So yeah. when she goes, I don't want to be a solo artist, let's make it a band. And we, I, we just decided to start a band. We got the band name. And when we told Tim, he was like, that is like the best lineup and the best idea ever. I, I, I'd be down to produce you and, you know, hopefully put out your record on Hellcat. And we were like, oh my gosh, this is like insane. So we got in the studio and we kind of like left that record and just built a whole new record yeah. based on the excitement of starting this band and like being in the studio with Tim as a producer. Like it was just such a cool whirlwind moment. We, we worked so fast. I mean, remember how fast, like that first record. Yeah probably spent like four actual days of recording on it because we were just oh. boom, boom, boom. And it was it was awesome. Yeah. Jesse, did your dad say to you ever, I don't know if you three brothers should be in a band. It could go totally haywire. Or was it the opposite? It was the opposite. He, he never strictly said like, you three should be playing music together. But it, it it's just the way it worked out. He made everything available to us. There was a drum set in the house. He had a guitar, a bass, keyboards, a Pro Tools rig in the house. So that was our video game at his house. We would go over there and we would play music. We would record music. We'd listen to music. That was just the environment he kind of created at his house. So it was very natural for the three of us. Um, from a very and young from age. A very yeah. young and you, what, how old were you guys when you started your first band with just you three? Our first recording was probably when we were eight years old and Kevin was 11. 11 or something, yeah. And that was our dad at a studio in Burbank and he would take us there when he had to work. But I don't know, one day he had time to kill him. I was like, you guys should record a song. So we did When I Come Around by Green Day. And if you want to oh hear God. the worst vocal performance of all time, <laughs> fifth grade Kevin Bavona <laughs> singing But you were kind of producing around. it too. I guess, yeah. I just remember you're yelling at the twins. Oh man, yeah. It was. Uh, <laughs> you did the album artwork, I yeah. Know. And it's it's we were super lucky to be like growing up playing music together because then we all found our own circles and went and joined other bands and played with other people. But it, we ended up right back together because it's just like it. That's just how it. You know, you always want to be in a band with the closest people to you. I think being in a band is a lot like a sibling relationship or a marriage or any sort of like, it's like an intimate relationship because you have this common goal in mind. If you really want to go for it and be in a band, you guys all have to have the same, like what's it called? Like finish line. Right. right. And you know, right. sometimes right. we disagree on how to get there, but if there's like a mutual respect and everyone feels heard and respected, like it's, it's a super close thing to be a part of. And uh, the fact that we have like, Twins, three brothers, a husband, wife, like all within the same band. And we spent a lot of years sharing just one room. Yeah. Wow. And one wow. hotel room for 
years. Yeah. We we shared very intimate places. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's awesome. Justin, refresh my memory on professionally and personally what was happening in your life in 2009, 10, and 11. 2009. Oh. Okay, so in 2009, we three brothers were in a band called Telecasters. Yes. And um, we got an opportunity to go on a tour that was um, Sugar Ray and the Dirty Heads. Kevin had um, been teching for Sugar Ray, and just Mark one night was like, yeah, sure, your band can open, like, the West Coast Lake. Okay. So we got, like, a handful of dates. <laughs> it was in September of 09. We get out there, and sure enough, Amy's solo artist on that tour. So it's us and Telecasters, Amy, Dirty Head, Sugar Ray. So we do that tour, and it's incredibly fun. We're 20, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years old. old. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I remember one of the first <laughs> nights we pull up to, like, the hotel in Arizona, and everyone – Drops her bags and goes to a bar, and me and Jesse are just standing like, "Oh, we can't do that." <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You can watch There's the a diner though. next door. Go get a burger. <laughs> yeah. um, so we did that, and then for for me and Jesse after that, like we did Telecasters, and then we were also starting to tech for more bands because Kevin was taking less of that work and kind of passing it to us. And we had met a lot of the same people he had met, and they were really helpful. Just be like, "Hey, yeah, you can tech this gig." So then. 2010, we started working for Sugar Ray. And now when you say working for Sugar Ray and teching, explain, what does that mean? So for that particular, for Sugar Ray, me and Jesse were stage left, stage right. He'd set up the drums and do Rodney's guitar. Yeah, and then I would do bass and Mark's guitar. And we'd set up everything, tune everything, change the strings. Like a truck full of crew. gear shows up and the yeah. twins open the truck right. and they build the yeah. sugar. Wow. Ray. And we say, those are the drum trunks. Those go downstage. Uh, that's guitar <laughs> stage right, bass stage left. <laughs> So we were doing that, and they were doing a ton. In 2010 or 11, they were doing a ton of fly gigs and a bunch of dates. So it was really cool for us because we were still living at home, and we were working a ton. And uh, eventually, during all that, that was when they were writing, and then the Interrupters formed in the end of 2011, and it really just segued into us doing this. But right? I will say at the same time we formed the Interrupters, we went to lunch with... Mark McGrath and Rodney from Sugar Ray. Right. And they had just had, they just broke up with the bass player and the drummer. So they took us out to lunch and said, we want you guys to play bass and drums. Okay. Right. Yeah. So yeah. what do you guys say? <laughs> Is that an instant yes? At the, yes, yes, it was. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I remember it was in November 2011. And guess where we were? Jerry's Famous Deli. Yes. <laughs> on <In> Ventura. <unison. laughs> on Ventura. It's By the bowling alley. alley? Yeah, yeah, I think I had a club sandwich. They're looking at me like, because I worked there at one point. <laughs> you yeah. worked at that Jerry's? Yeah. On Beverly, yeah. Oh, the That's one on Beverly? Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. The the, the, the one the next to guys? Shift. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> so, Mark McGrath and Rodney. He sat right here once. I watched. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Can you guys be part of the band? So, yeah. that means... You learn every single song, and you're on stage, and is it like Mark McGrath says, guys, this is how I want everything to be done, and you just kind of follow that lead? Honestly, it wasn't until, like, so the first rehearsal with us, we went in uh, to a rehearsal room. We set everything up. We dialed in the monitors. It's just me and Justin. Maybe one other tech, or was it just us no, two? it was just us day one. No, I, I, think, I feel like Robert was there. But, uh... We set everything up, Rodney and Mark come in. They go, okay, let's run. Let's like run every morning. And we're like, all right, let's do it. I count off. We go, we play it. We finish. Mark turns around and goes, why did that sound so good? <laughs> and me and Justin melt in place. We're like, <laughs> like, I like, you mean like the monitors or like the music? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he's just like, that just sounded great. He, and like, I think from that moment on, he was like, I made the right choice. And so we spent the next year. Wow. All of. Uh, well, yeah, 2012, touring with them. That was our first summer tour. Uh, amphitheaters. Like, uh, amphitheaters in a bus. Air, in a bus. Yeah, Condo was, comfortable. Yeah, we were like, hey, that's not how it and is. Then, right? yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Well, then we get an opportunity <laughs> yeah. to open up for Rancid and the Transplants in 2013, and they had the opportunity to go out on that tour, and we had to have a sit down and say, listen, wouldn't you rather get into a minivan? I'll share the same <laughs> room. Us, one hotel room and build this band from the ground up. Does that sound enticing? And actually they came. And then the rest is, you know, history in the making, I guess. I don't know. But, but just because you have four super talented people individually doesn't necessarily guarantee that they'll be, it'll be a cohesive unit when the songs are made. 
So what was the first or second song, Kevin, that you guys made? Did you give it to someone and then it was like, oh my God, this is a real thing. Here we go. Well, for the interrupters? Yes. Well, I mean, the first song that we ever recorded in the studio together was a song on our first record called A Friend Like Me, which was actually the first single from the first record. It was our opening number for a while live. And it was just one of those things that was like one of these songs that Amy and I had like just kind of, I know, you know, we just had it in our heads forever and we would always like sing it to each other. And then we get in the studio and like kind of worked out this like verse part with Tim. And then we just got on our instruments and pressed record. And what you hear is like this first sound, first, first sound we made. Yeah. And that was the first time the interrupters like materialized on a recording. So we didn't have like an agenda. It was weird. We almost were like super, I was like, oh, I like the way this guitar tone sounds. I was never thinking about how it would sound with that song. Justin's bass sound was like something he came up with. Then Amy, like it was so funny because we go in the studio to record it and she goes, this is such a weird key. Like I'm singing really low and we were like, but it sounds really cool because that's just the way we always did it. She's like, uh, and I was like, you know, most people might like want to send it up a register or whatever, but we, and it was almost like everything just kind of happened organically in this way where like we, that's what we sound like now. And then we just built on that. God, I'm such a fan of you guys individually and as a band. Seriously, I'm inspired and I root for you so hard. Thank Amy, you. I have a, can I throw some, Throwing things at you right, All right now. Hit me. <laughs> Your experience in the music business before the Interrupters officially became a band was it positive, negative, or in the middle? Oh man, it was been a it's been a journey. You know, uh, I've been a it's been it's a tough business. <laughs> you know, uh, but I've been doing music, writing songs since I was eight years old. And I've, I've always known that that's what I was going to do with my life. Always. I mean, since, I, well, since I was eight, since I first, since I wrote my mom a birthday song because I didn't have any money and, it, and I was so upset that I couldn't buy her a gift. And so I wrote her a Aww. birthday song and it's really it's not a great song, but we still sing it every, all of us sing it as a family tradition every year for everybody's birthday. We'll sing it for you on your birthday. Okay. Um, but yes. it's, it's not a great <laughs> song, but it's still, it's a tradition. Um, but in that moment in writing the song for my mom and seeing the look on her face and the tears in her eyes, I just thought, I don't need money to buy her a gift. I can, m music is a gift. So I could just write songs and I could give that to people to let them know I love them. And I just started, I just always have written songs. It's just all I've ever written since I was eight years old. And it's how I've gotten through my pain in my life, writing it out and writing, you know, writing so much. And then from my poetry or from my writings, I can find songs in there from that. But sometimes I just have a song that just comes to me without writing it down too. But so I, uh, when, uh, when I was 18, 19 years old, I knew that I wanted to pursue music as a career. And so I, I met this band in a bar in Montana where I was born and raised and where in Montana, what city Missoula in Missoula, mm -hmm. Montana. Okay. And they were this punk oh. band. They just came through town and they said they lived in LA. And the night before I met them, I had a dream that I moved to LA. So when I met them, I was like, I, I just had a dream last night that I moved to LA and you guys live in LA. It's a sign. Like I should just go with you guys to LA. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the next night in town, I had a show with my band. I, I had a little band up there and they came to the show and they really liked the show and they said I could follow them to LA. Although, like I said, they lived in Orange County and I could stay <laughs> with them for a couple of days. And, um, when I, when I got there, I followed them. I left, I left town. Did you need permission from your mom? No. You just was like, this is it. I'm going. So you come to LA in the same van as them? An orange, my own orange car. County? Yeah. Okay. Your own car. And I stayed with them for a few days and then I realized, oh, this isn't really LA. This is, so I decided to take my car and I drove, this is so ridiculous when I say it out loud, but I drove to, to the Hollywood sign. Cause I wanted, or to, so I could see the Hollywood sign because I thought, well, that's LA. And then I'll just park my car and then I'll take a deep breath and then right. I'll figure out what I'm going to do from there. 
So I called the bartender from the the bar that I was at where I met these guys. And I said, hey, remember those guys I met in the, that punk band? Well, I followed them to, you know, California. And long story short, uh, I don't, I'm in LA and I don't know anybody. Do you happen to know anybody? And the reason I called that bartender is because there's a little movie called A River Runs Through It that yes, was filmed in my Brad hometown. Pitt. Yeah. Robert Redford. And he was he was an extra and I thought like maybe you <laughs> met like someone from LA. That's the most LA thing in Montana. Oh, I know. It was the most LA thing. So I thought, well, maybe he knows someone just from the being in the movie or whatever. And he did. And and the per and he said, let me make a phone call. I'm going to see uh, if, if my friend, you know, has a room for rent, you know, if, if, if you, I could introduce you to my friend. And the person that was his friend that had a room for rent that he said to go to this address and knock on the door where I was calling is where I was parked. I could see the house no. from where I was. And, and I told him what street I was on. He's like, just walk over and knock on the door. I mean, it was the weirdest, most surreal thing. So I knocked on the door. I was like, hey, so I'm friends with the bartender from that Montana. And they're like, yeah, we have room for rent. So from there, um, I was like, all right, now I have a place to, to to rent. And then it was really, 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 really inexpensive, which is nice. And um, and then I just said, okay, now I need to find some musicians. So every day I would walk up and down Sunset Boulevard and I would ask anyone if they wanted to start a punk band with me. And so they'd be like, oh, I like metal or I like this kind of music. I'm like, all right. And I'm like, I need a punk band. Do you like punk music? Do you want to start a punk band with me? And I did that every every day that I worked at- So you're I 19 at, years old doing yeah, this. And you I, worked where? It was Jerry's Famous Deli. Okay. <laughs> at the Graveyard I Shift. I love Jerry's. You do it. So what is that, 11 to six or something? Yeah. And so when I didn't, when I wasn't working, that when I didn't have a shift, I would always be on Sunset Boulevard walking up and down, introducing myself to people, seeing if they want to start a band with me. And because I didn't know what else to do. And I did meet a band that did want to do punk music. There was a, a punk band called No Motive, actually. And uh, we did some, we wrote some songs together. We played a couple of shows. At one of our first shows, Randy Jackson was there. And he was like, I'm going to help you get a record deal. I think you're awesome. So so Randy Jackson sees you, signs you. So he sees me. He didn't sign me, but he wanted to make sure that I got signed. So okay. he kind of shopped my music around. And um, I got a record deal with Electra Records. And that I worked with Mark Ronson. And he, he's, he was amazing. He had just worked with Amy Winehouse and Lily Allen. Wow. I mean, I worked with a bunch of different producers for that album, but... Um, Mark, I mean, I, I'm such a big fan of his. I love him so much. But the record, unfortunately, just just like as it is in the music business, gets shelved. You know, I mean, why was it shelved? Do you think? What's the I, reason? I think that the label folded. I mean, it was just a because now they they folded into Atlantic, I think, and. Or Atlanta, or Atlantic, the Atlantic Ocean. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they got swept up in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> no, yeah. So they, um, they just. I mean, everybody, everybody on the label got, um, you know, had, basically. Um, but I, I couldn't release music under my name for uh, seven years, and it was really difficult because that's just how it is, you know. When I was finally able to actually release music under my name, I. I was like, actually, I don't want to now. <laughs> I really right. wanted to for so many years, but then when I could, I, I was happy to be the interrupters. And um, and I'm really loving that I'm not a solo artist. It's just something that I, it's, it's a lot of pressure. And when I see solo artists, I'm just so admire them because I know how hard it is and I know how much pressure you can put on yourself and, and all of that. And I think I, my hat goes off to it, but to anyone that can do it, but I, I personally, I'm I'm a band girl for sure. Yeah, and now she's she always says like, well, you know, at least if the show's not good, it says the interrupters yeah. are there, <laughs> yeah. and not just my name. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Amy, did you ever feel like that you had something to prove to anybody back in Montana? Like, look, see, I did it. You maybe there were naysayers there, and like, look at me, look, look how things are going. Well, yeah, everybody except for my mom thought <laughs> my mom always supported me. My mom always believed in me, but. Uh, everybody thought I was absolutely insane to go to a big city like Los Angeles and not know anyone and just try and do music. It just sounds completely absurd. But I believed that it was my destiny. I believed that that I didn't have, that was my life plan, 
path. Like I was supposed to write music and meet other people that wanted to do music. And where I was from, that was just was never going to happen. So I, like the first song in the record, anything was better than where I was from. It wasn't necessarily about a town or in a place. It was the circumstances I was in that that I just had to take the risk. I had to see. Otherwise, I would always be, just be sitting in Montana not doing music, wondering right. like what could have happened if right. I just was brave enough to go out and try it. And I'm now so glad I did. we're going to be headlining the Kettle House Amphitheater in Bonner, Montana, uh, right outside Missoula in we September. Are? We are, yeah. We're going to go back and... To that bar. No, no, to, no. Oh, a much, much bigger Much bigger one. place. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's an amphitheater. It's an amphitheater in, in my Montana. hometown. And I haven't been back there and played played my hometown since 2015. Since, since yeah, we we did a support slot there in 2015. Yeah, so our it's our biggest Saturday. show in my hometown. So it's it's, it's first a bit, headline too. It's a first headline show in my hometown since I left. So it's kind of a wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. And you know, if no one has said it to you recently. Kudos to you. That takes so much strength to leave a place where you were at 18, 19 years old and come out here, go to Orange County, then go to the Hollywood sign and then rent a room and then go work at Jerry's Deli. And then who wants to play punk rock? Who wants to do yes. it? Yeah. And then having the talent and the strength to be recognized and getting a deal with a real label and a zillion artists have been shelved. And look what happened. Here you are. Like you did it. You, yeah. you, you did it. It, it happened. So I found, because of your I found talent. my people. I found yeah. I'm, yes, you I'm did. so I'm so so grateful. And you didn't even have to walk down Sunset Boulevard. You just had to go <laughs> on that Sugar Ray tour <laughs> in that field in Santa Margarita that one day. Yeah. And you're like, hey, what's up? <laughs> yeah. You playing a band? Let's play in a band. But it was love at first sight when yeah. Kevin and I met each other. That's true. We both, when we shook each other's hand. I was like, I know you already. I, I felt like, like we felt like we knew each other and that we yeah. We just had this soul, instant soul connection. Meant to be in each other's lives. And we were friends wow. for a year wow. before we ever, you know, did any, you know, roman uh, yeah. romantic at all. But we, we were friends for a year, and but we both just felt that we were soulmates. Wow. Oh and I God. kid you not on that tour, yeah. every night Kevin would like wander up to one of us in the band and be like, have you seen my future wife anywhere? Really? Yeah. And me did you think he was crazy, or were you? Did you give him like, respect? Like, I'm not sure where Amy's at. There's a video that I saw. I of saw a video of the met, night we met. We had a video camera with us on that tour, and, and you like, hear him off camera say, "Ask where his future wife is." <laughs> at, the day we met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was kind of stalker, kind of cable guy. <laughs> yeah, once cable, again. cable guy. Like, where did you find the future wife, <laughs> <laughs> Stephen? <Yeah>. Okay, <laughs> so good. Um. You're about to hit the road again with yes. Flogging Molly. We are. And how did, have you known those guys for years? I mean, what a live show they put on. No. I would be scared. Of, I mean, you guys are, of course, they're, 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 they're so good. Live. They're so good live. But also, I mean, we've obviously seen them and known them as a band. But yeah. We've been following them for years, but we didn't really get to know them until this tour. And they're just the most lovely people and so sweet. And it's such a family vibe on that tour. And just all the bands. There's the Skins, Tiger Army, Flag and yep. Molly. Like it was oh, just such God. a fun run. Yeah, such they're a, amazing human beings. How was Nick yeah. Thirteen? Was he lovely? Did Great. you talk to him? Did yeah. he amazing voice? Yeah. Great. And then the Skins from England who opened the show are oh, friends right. of ours. Is there a picture in, in here? Yeah, because yeah. they okay. sang on one of the songs. They're, they're so right. killer and they're so awesome. fun. But it, yeah, we can't wait to do that second leg. Before we do that, we're going to go to Europe and play some festivals and then some headline shows and some headline shows in the UK. And we got but a bunch of stuff. Wow, good yeah. for you guys. Um, all right, this is the album right here. It's In the Wild. And you know what I love? There's a song, Raised by Wolves. When I watch movies and they subtly throw in the name of the movie in a scene, I like that. You say the name of the album in Raised by Wolves. Yes. Yes. In the Wild. In the Wild. It really encompasses the whole the whole. You album. left a child. Out in the wild. Out, out in the wild. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I think that, you know, the story that I just told about where I was from, the first, the, that story is told in the first song. told in the first song called Anything Was Better Than Where I Was From. And it starts there and then it kind of goes, it goes to, to now, basically. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Everyone go get the album in the wild. I mean, we can keep hanging out. We're going to go have cake in the other yes. room. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I should have brought my bathing suit. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? Are you <laughs> to go swimming? Yes. You can you go night swimming? No, I don't go day swimming. <laughs> <laughs> I Luckily, we can swim here. I haven't swam in the pool in like 10 years. What? Yes. Oh. It looks really you know, nice. There's no pool furniture out there. I threw it all away like 10 years ago. 
I love you, Striker, but you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Well, right. it's nice. We're gonna we're gonna all, all jump in the pool. Well, all right. we love you so much, and you and you, you. We, and we just seriously. I mean, in 2014, you played us uh, for the first time on the radio. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. On our first and album. We'll never forget it, and we just oh, love you so much. You've always been you. so supportive of us, and thank you. I appreciate you saying that, and the support is right back at you guys. I'm a huge fan, and it's only getting bigger every single year. And it should be a marathon, not a sprint. Yep. Yes. All right. Uh, they are the interrupters, everybody. Find them on the road. Get the new record. And appreciate you checking out Tuna on Toast. I'll see you on the next one. Happy snuggles. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Tuna on Toast. Where's the missus? She is in bed. Oh, yeah. she is. Yeah, early one, huh? Yeah. Will you send my love? I love her. I She's so sweet. So Look at this great <laughs> picture. I mean, I'm Look at that. Just start right in the middle of me. Yeah, it's fine. It's cut me in half. Hold on, right there. There I'm not offended at all. It's fine. This cake looks so good. Oh, I like your style. Oh, okay. You all right. Little... I work at 31 Flavor, so I have experience. Oh, no it's way. Yeah. yeah, you got It's good. It's pro. Wasn't it the one on Sepulveda? Well, that, I know. That is so the one on Sunset Boulevard in Barrington. No oh, way. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got some for breakfast, too. Oh, you're an espresso guy. Yes. Nespresso. Nespresso. So is Kevin. I'm a big Nespresso. Head. And I'm a, I'm a Keurig, so we have oh, a Keurig wow. in the kitchen and an Nespresso. Okay, watch this. Everyone gets one guess at the Everybody silverware drawer. Everybody gets one guess at the silverware drawer. Don't tell me. Okay. <laughs> oh my god, I love it! Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. Think <laughs> of <laughs> Wait, hold on. I want to guess the random batteries and scotch <laughs> tape drawer. Okay. Yes. Okay. There we go. It's gotta be this one. <laughs> oh! Yeah! Where's their uh, the the pot holder? Where's the mm, pot holder? Pot holder. Oh, that's gotta be right next to the, the silverware. Ah, oh. I would say this. No. Oh, what's that? Oh, oh I'm going over. Here. I'm not even sure I know where things are. Oh! Hope you enjoyed. Now hit that subscribe button, and for more tuna on toast, listen wherever you get your podcasts.